Yeah, Torchwood, finally a big boy show. Time to say goodbye to family friendly cutaways, anti gun laws. It's time for some sex, blood, and uh. Chris Chibnall. I had a lot of fond memories of this show, but after a long, hard binge watch of the first season, there's a lot of hit and miss shit going on here. I also want to personally thank all of you blessed patrons for your continued support, without which I wouldn't have even considered making a review of this show. There won't be any numerical ratings because I feel it's unfair to compare scores I've given to Doctor Who. Obviously this show's budget was limited in comparison, and I'm mainly going to be discussing my experience re-watching the show, meaning what I believe the show's strengths and weaknesses are. So strap in, because we have a lot of episodes to cover. And funnily enough, this certainly does appear to be one of the show's biggest faults from the offset. It's excessive. I'd have been fine with six episodes of Torchwood per season, and it's no surprise therefore that Children of Earth, which only has five episodes, is my favourite of the bunch. It seems that most of the money they threw at Torchwood was sent to hiring the high-definition cameras. Although 2006's definition of HD is 10 80 interlaced. This comes with its own technical issues like varying degrees of frame rate as a result of motion blur or CGI. Some shots appear very cinematic whilst others give it a real soap opera vibe. These shall we say soapy shots in particular contrast horribly whenever a monster or God forbid a dinosaur appears on screen. The music in the series is serviceable at best. Murray Gold's input feels very thin alongside Ben Foster, but I'll give credit where it's due. That one metallic piece that plays over the Torchwood is ready for the future sequence is really gritty, but these very sequences are part of the drag too. I'm sure at the time it was necessary for potentially curious channel flickers, but binging them all one after the other, man that mantra gets old fun. Anyone with a keen ear will also notice that in this first series they love playing Snow Patrol spitting games whenever they go into a bar to kill time. Anyway, that just about does it for my general thoughts, let's jump into the first episode. Right from the very opening scene, the story plants seeds of conflict between Torchwood and the police. This is certainly a theme I would have liked to have seen more of, but unfortunately it only really comes into play again in the other Susie episode. I liked the portrayal of the police in this though, with 90% of the staff being layabouts, sick of their routine, and the remainder being officers who take their job seriously. This could have worked for Gwen as a character who's overly investigative but not appreciated, as she's instead rushed into being a proficient member of the Torchwood team. You get a sense of this when one minute she's sorting out a pub brawl, the next she's creeping down a corridor towards a weevil. Don't get me wrong, her first alien encounter is fantastic. This random Welsh hospital worker's commentary about plastic surgery leading to real teeth before getting his neck torn open was built up terrifically. The blood definitely doesn't have me fooled today, but this moment traumatised me when I was 10. This was, in all likelihood, the the most gory thing I'd ever seen in my life, but in hindsight I think it's the build-up that makes this moment so worthwhile. A sealed off section of a building opens the doors to the unknown and seeing a humanoid slowly turning into something grotesque as we get closer to it is really unnerving. I also liked the scene when Gwen managed to infiltrate Torchwood. After a horrific encounter with one weevil, imagining a whole underworld of them laying low in the sewers of Cardiff is certainly no pretty picture. Another theme that ripples through the first series is that of the captain's authority being undermined. Jack thinks he's running a tight ship, but everyone's taking bits of alien tech home with them for their own personal gains. It's a nice bit of fun, but in reality only establishes how two-dimensional our characters are. The show's age definitely shows in this sequence, considering no bag checks take place at Torchwood, and Ianto deleting Gwen's computer was downright hilarious. Jack himself struggles with his invincibility. He's still a flawed character due to having a fear of death, something he has to evidently face on a regular basis. Though this fear is somewhat contradicted by these bizarre shots of him standing on rooftops either alone or with Gwen. The climax of this episode was a little odd too. Jack appearing as a still PNG was funny and it was quite astounding that Susie fired a gun twice in the middle of Cardiff and nobody gave a shit. You can have guns, but within the confines of Cardiff, 
if it should prove to be a problem to overcome, especially when it comes to the police. Suddenly removing Susie also made Gwen remember all the stuff Jack made her forget the day before, just wrapped things up a little too conveniently for my liking too. Davy sets the stage in this episode and now hands the power over to a writing team. Let's see what they did with this freedom and power, shall we? Oh dearie me. Imagine a show that's advertising itself as being adult Doctor Who and having an episode that is known as the Sex Monster episode. It just sounds immature to say it out loud, doesn't it? I loved that the height of technology in 2006 was having computers built into the Torchwood car. Have these guys never heard of a thing called a laptop? Watching the initial sex scene itself three times was hilariously bad. Even this bouncer who lets in a girl because she snogged him, and then wanking off in the CCTV room, the cringe meter went off the scale for me. It really confused me that Gwen, who was eager to impress on her first day, goes into the cell knowing she too could explode. Ironically enough, nobody in the team gives a crap about her, and like the bouncer scene earlier, seemingly all get off on the idea. After a really awkwardly pointless dinner scene, Gwen started typing on a laptop that wasn't even on, and all of a sudden Owen thought of turning himself into atoms too. Jack evidently doesn't hire people for combating alien threats, but more for their skills in the bedroom. I know Jack's a sex fiend too, but if all the characters are just sex fiends, why should I care? For the remainder of the episode, things just spiral right out of control. The fight between Jack and the girl in the base was really funny, as though suddenly this sex monster has both seductive and physical powers too. The combination of shaky cam and motion blur did not help this fight sequence either. The show has this actress perform this strange form of schizophrenia that doesn't aid the premise in any way. The girl goes into her ex's house where she asks, did you ever love me? And the bloke flat out says, no. And then they proceeded to have sex. Then they suddenly threw another strange factor into the mix that she worked in a sperm bank. Had this been made evident earlier, this could have worked in the story's favor, but this is where the climax of the episode, no pun intended, occurs and God, it's awful. It tries being funny by having the girl sleep with slash kill all these men waiting to donate sperm, but once again just comes off as cringy and practically unbearable to watch. Not to mention the means of separating the monster from the girl was by having Jack kiss her and then Gwen kisses him for... Ugh, I haven't a fucking clue. This episode is a disaster. <laughs> What, what? What? What was that episode about again? Three episodes in and I'm realizing just how two-dimensional Owen and Tosh are. Yes, they have episodes dedicated to them individually, but at the start they just seem like cardboard cutouts of man whore and geek girl. Gwen gives the team another reason to kick her off, but she gives Owen and Jack hard on so she gets to stick around. No better is this established than when she spontaneously expresses care for Owen and later in that really creepy scene where Jack shows her how to fire a gun. It is so overly sexual and yet gets super dramatic by the end as well. All just to show how lonely Jack is? Gwen and Owen manage to get into somebody's house without showing any ID or anything and then Owen sees a flashback that looks cheaper than the pasties he bought earlier. Four pasties for a pound. He later goes to find the man from the flashback in the present day and this scene has these ridiculous handheld close-ups that echo the same overly dramatic moments we saw with Gwen and Jack. Afterwards, Owen chases around the chav from Hot Fuzz. Even though their release dates were quite close, I wouldn't be surprised if this chase sequence was a nod to that film, given all the garden fences they climb over. Then we got the greatest moment of the entire series. Gwen! No! Oh god, that cracked me up. The climax of the story once again winds up being hilariously bad, especially Gwen's shocked face that I couldn't take seriously. The episode definitely didn't give me the emotion it was trying to aim for, and overall it's a flat and uninteresting story. Glad I won't be watching it ever again. 
Throughout the first three episodes, I was wondering why Ianto had so little to do. This episode acted almost as a revenge story and worked well for his character. All the pain he's endured and the secrecy must have been unbearable. Unfortunately, the reveal's hard rock anthem is just diabolical and the whole episode is horribly filmed too. Once more, we have the handheld soap opera shit going on, but this time it's filled up with quick zooms too, just to make it all the more laughable. I'd complain about the cyber suit being a Objectifying, re but let's be frank here. Objectifying is exactly what cyber upgrading does to people, so with the context of Doomsday hidden in the background, I'm giving it the okay. Intriguingly too, I watched the series with subtitles on and the BBC liked to colourise the text to indicate who's talking. In the Cyberwoman's subtitles, she has a blue shadow, which I thought was a nice touch. It was funny that Ianto was mocked for his quote-unquote girlfriend in a similar fashion to when people are mocked for having digital girlfriends online as though they aren't real. In fact, having the whole episode localised to the base was a great idea too. We learn of the lockdown procedures that operate in case of internal emergencies. This does lead to a slight hitch, however. You know I mentioned Gwen being rushed into the Torchwood team earlier? No better can this be seen than when she demonstrates her understanding of all the codes and protocols that the audience simply don't know about. It sounds boring, but Gwen is our most relatable character, so when she knows something we don't, we feel cheated. Just like like in Chibnall's previous story, there's a lot of kissing in this episode too. Gwen and Owen getting all cosy up in a cupboard was weird, and Jack kissing Ianto felt very forced too. Then the pterodactyl saves the day, and my god, does it look awful. The episode left us on a high note though, questioning if we should treat all alien life with hostility, but unfortunately Gareth David Lloyd's performance lets the episode down here, as I honestly wasn't convinced by his sadness at all. Hmm. Elves that aren't elves protecting children from abusive men. Where have I heard that one before? Oh, that's right. This is literally just the Lost Children chapter of the Berserk manga, but in a modern setting and produced by the BBC. I liked the choking on petals thing, and I really liked the relationship between Jack and this old lady, Estelle. It was pretty clear from the start that she didn't date Jack's father, but just dated Jack when she was younger, and he made her blissfully ignorant by keeping her in the dark for a a few decades until he could reappear again. Cruel but kind, I love it. Had it not been for Estelle, I think this episode probably wouldn't have made that much of an impression on me. They also love playing with the weather in both Doctor Who and the spin-offs. Probably because it's cheap! The resurrection glove causes it to rain, now the elves can control the weather to uh, literally kill people. They really didn't hold back with Jack holding Estelle in his arms though. This was definitely the peak moment of the episode for me. Unfortunately, the episode episode is plagued with point of view shots for the elves, and when they showed up at the end, the CGI has dated horribly too. Even worse was when they used some old stock footage for an establishing shot of a train, and when we saw Jack and the men on the train, it went back up to HD with a little sepia tone applied. Forget things aging badly though, and feast your eyes on the last act, because my god it's a shit show. The elves produce a hurricane at this girl's school, and frighten the crap out of two bullies. Unfortunately, Unfortunately, the whole thing just looks awful and is completely tensionless. Then there came the garden party and it all just fell to pieces. Another hilarious climax for a half-baked premise. Now this is what I call Torchwood. I was literally about to give up due to the piss poor quality I had to sit through beforehand, but it all comes to the fold once we reach countryside. Better still is that this episode is written by our good friend Chris Chibnall, and I think it succeeds so tremendously because the monster of this episode is humanity. We aren't exactly sure what is creating all these bodies until 30 minutes in, and that's enough time to really ramp up the mystery and fear. There's more unknown in the wilderness than there is in cities, so the location is great for starters. We have a great sexy moment between Owen and Gwen, the corpses look fantastic, there's some really nice establishing shots of the Welsh valleys, and then shit hits the fan when the group got separated, and Gwen got fucking shot! The most dramatic thing that's happened all season, and it's 
a terrific moment. Not only does it feel like karma for her entanglements with Owen, but it genuinely surprised me too. Obviously she has plot immunity, but it was utilised perfectly when Owen was dealing with her wound. The injury looks so real, the sexual tension is through the roof, and Owen proves he's actually a doctor and not just some horny bastard. Hell, I'd sleep with a guy if he pulled bullets right out of me. Before you know it, Alyssa Thorne shows up, turning out to be one of the many flesh-hungry cannibals of this episode. His performance elevates the story into the sky quality-wise, even if he's only around for the last 10 minutes or so. The final set with all the corpses and our characters just being brought to their lowest point, Jesus Christ. I'd argue that Jack's entrance is kind of ridiculous and a little contrived, but in the countryside, a tractor is is obviously very fitting. All the dread and horror that's taken place, it contrasts to a positively hilarious effect. The only thing stopping a massacre from taking place is Gwen needing to know why somebody would behave so abhorrently. The interrogation scene that followed was so horrifying as well, with Thorn claiming the whole thing made him happy. It's a really disturbing episode, and Gwen's transformation as a character was really welcome too. I don't mind this episode too much, maybe because it's the Tosh-centric one, the only character we know least about. How an alien seduces and manipulates her is kind of interesting. I think the idea of a pendant or device that allows a character to hear others' thoughts, though, is a bit of a sci-fi trope at this point, but it creates some good drama when Tosh is at work and hears Gwen and Owen thinking about when they're next gonna fuck. This is, however, the episode where a sound effect from the Halo video games is heard over and over again. <laughs> When Tosh is looking around town for a good use for her mind-reading pendant, she stalks a bloke that's thinking about killing his family. Coincidentally, this is the same actor who plays Yaz's dad in those absolutely classic Doctor Who episodes in series 11 and 12. It becomes apparent as the episode goes on that both relationships, Gwen and Owen, Tosh and the alien, are getting really toxic, and a keen observer will notice this alien Tosh has gotten acquainted with is the same one that shows up in the pilot of the Sarah Jane adventures. It's cheap as chips for sure, but I do wonder if SJ was experiencing the same feelings as Tosh did at the start of that story. As the episode closes, we have another melodramatic, horribly dated and overly noisy climax that leaves the episode rather forgettable, but ends on a sweet note with Jack and Tosh's final conversation. Now this episode has got to be my favourite of series one. It definitely redeems the pilot episode for its shortcomings and has to be one of the most brutal episodes too. The opening is awesome, seeing the corpses with Torchwood strewn across the wall in blood. It sets the seeds for this idea that Torchwood have been making a name for themselves and now people are killing to get their attention. The scenes reviving Susie with the glove were excellent, if a little too Gwen so special for my liking. The big hole in her head, the mystery of how she's still alive and eventually finding out she's draining Gwen was fantastic. She did look kind of funny with the headset on and all the antics in the club were a bit weird too. Gwen has some great conversations with Susie and Jack though, debating what to do with Susie and the idea of replacement and succession gets thrown into the mix too. The gang then get locked inside the base with a really humorous and rewarding scene with the police having to find their password for them. Whilst that's going on, Susie's having an existential crisis with Gwen and in the car, exploring ideas like how memories work and life after death. We're just animals howling in the night because it's better than silence. It's moments like these where I realise how good of an actress Indira Varma truly is. Admittedly, she's the Sean Bean of actresses, seeing that she dies all the time, but her performances have always been consistently good, the height of which comes when she kills her fucking Dad. We're thinking she just wants to say one last teary goodbye, when really she just wanted revenge for God knows what. All whilst Gwen is slowly being shot in the back of the head. Jesus Christ, it is all so disturbing. The final scene on the boardwalk was really crushing as well. It is what makes this series stand out so starkly from the show it's spinning off of. This cold-blooded murder from our protagonist just blew me away. Susie getting shot so many 
many times before they destroyed the glove. The slow-mo montage and song was a bit weird, but what followed with the stopwatch between Ianto and Jack was so saucy. I loved it. The sting in the tail, though, was when Ianto mentioned the glove being one of two, which just sent so many shivers down my spine and left me wholly satisfied with this brutal, thoughtful, flawed, yet horrifying episode. There I was, starting to enjoy the series a bit more, and they threw a love and monsters scenario at us. This episode can jog right on. I didn't even finish it, it was that bad. Eugene is literally just Elton, and as soon as the title theme played, I thought... Uh-oh. Uh -oh. Those flashbacks were fucking horrendous. Not even Mace Tyrell could save them. David Bowie would be rolling in his grave knowing his song would be used in such a cringy CGI sequence. That was the night Dad went away. <laughs> My dad never came back. <laughs> Just like in Love and Monsters, the Elton character grows a weird attraction for one of the main female characters, this time it's Gwen. The fact he can't interact with her makes it all the more creepy though. The Torchwood team wind up at his mum's house, and I ended up wondering the same thing as Owen. What are we doing here? And by the end of that scene, Torchwood just go and steal all his shit. Right afterwards, Gwen went to some video shop, and then I just skipped. Yeah, oh my god, what a waste. The way this episode integrated historic individuals into the present setting was excellent. People vanishing from their own times, Bermuda Triangle style, and then appearing in the present created great humour and a great story. People from the 50s seeing supermarkets was great, especially this approach that they are treated more like refugees attempting to assimilate, that was just brilliant. Attitudes may have changed, but horny men certainly haven't, and Owen manages to seduce the pilot. Watching Reese adjust to this random woman living with Gwen made for some great drama too. Even the scene when the man from the plane sees his son ridden with dementia was truly heartbreaking. Thing is though, I'm so used to these historical portrayals in Doctor Who that it didn't really stand out that much for me. Owen's sex scenes and attempts at love got a little cringy and tiring. Even the Romeo and Juliet antics with their departure just threw me right off. The absolute highlight though was seeing Jack with the 50s bloke enacting a weird form of euthanasia. That was so unique and emotional. Unfortunately, the episode leaves us on a sour note with this montage of everything that's just happened to force emotion down our throats. It's a decent episode, but definitely not one I'm thinking of rushing back to anytime soon. Mickey the Idiot. <sighs> Seriously, Noel Clark can't write to save his life. In fairness, he was kind of given the Boomtown episode here. You know, that one episode where the recurring monster shows up and they're all running around Cardiff to contain it. Don't get me wrong, there are a few highlights in this episode. I liked that Reese had a stomp about Gwen's dedication to her job, and her admitting to cheating was quite a moment too, unable to even live with Reese's reaction by drugging him. This paid off with some wonderful karma when she breaks down with the pizza at the base. That was terrific. The dialogue and the production quality of this episode are piss poor though. There's a fight at the start of the episode between Jack and a weevil which has a jaw-dropping continuity error with what's in Jack's hands. Same thing happens in this random parking lot where we get a close-up of some criminal and a second later he's in the van and they're driving off. Three minutes in and I was already frustrated. The gang are on the hunt for some people that leads them to a boring empty location. Owen's heartbreak leads him to some rich boys fight club, which was really weird. There was a hilarious moment when Owen hacks into the rich boys laptop, which he would obviously have been caught doing here. Then they go back to the same budget bar Owen went into earlier and gets into another fight. It's almost like the episode is called Combat Harry. Apparently the guy has a weevil locked up for a punching bag as well, and I get what they were going for is just the execution of the whole thing is terrible. Thing is as well, they did the whole humans are the real monsters in countryside and the theme feels a bit contrived in this episode. The climax is once again bizarre and Rich Boy's off-screen death was cringy as heck. Throughout the whole episode, which I successfully sat through this time, I just kept wondering, when will it end?
I do have a soft spot for the Blitz when depicted in fiction. The notion of everybody being frightened out of their wits all the time for years and years, man. I mention this because I have a vague memory of me watching this episode and crying. It didn't happen to me this time though, probably because Out of Time was written by the same person and they do hit similar beats. This time Tosh is directly involved though and her character is utilised so effectively for the time period. That moment when she gets accused of being the enemy was quite astonishing and only thanks to the commanding officers does she stay safe. Jack himself has quite the emotional encounter with the real Captain Jack Harkness. Their romantic awkwardness definitely gave the episode its appeal. Jack's identity, or lack thereof is put into question, and only when it is established that they would have loved each other makes for a cruel and saddening prospect. It certainly seems that monsters are not truly essential for this show to succeed. Either that or the budget required it, but the stories revolving around the past or showing humanity to be the real monsters show what a more mature vision of Doctor Who would look like. The most intriguing part of the story to me was how Tosh and Jack were able to communicate with the present. This communication is obviously rather limited, but it's this very limitation that has Tosh cutting herself to write a message in her own blood. That was uncomfortable to watch. Right at the end with the real Captain Jack saluting as it all faded away was wonderful too. Probably my second favourite episode of this series. And then we have the clusterfuck that is the finale. <laughs> The only thing I liked about this episode was, ironically enough, Owen. How they handled the plague outbreak and when he finally went overboard was the most interesting parts of this episode. You even have a great concept of monsters and time flooding through the rift, but the execution is something else, man. The opening was so cringy, and from there I just grew bored and tired. I hadn't a clue what the timekeeper did or why he was involved, which is funny because he played such a tiny role role in the previous episode too, that whenever he popped up I was just left baffled and confused. Even after Gwen finally does something justifiable to keep Reese safe, the timekeeper just stabs him for no reason. I literally wrote, Time is spewing globally and too much weird Billis Manger shit is going on for me to pay attention. The randomness is inherent in the plot, but not what comes out of the rift, as Owen was reunited with his past lover. It kind of reduced the emotion behind their separation, because quite frankly I think Owen deserved to be left alone after all the lustful stunts he's pulled throughout the series. Just in case we needed more bizarre shit to fill up the runtime, they all started doubting Jack. He got shot again. And and quite frankly, we all know what's coming, so it all felt plain boring to me. Then, out of fucking nowhere, a giant outdated looking Minotaur came through the rift. Billis was there on cue to introduce it to, and I just laughed. The climaxes of the episodes in this series can be so poorly thought out. You can't just throw a monster in the last 10 minutes and expect us to care. It was so hilarious seeing it blunder around alone and then just cutting to corpses. Oh, it's shadow kills people? How fucking cheap is that? And the solution? Just throw Jack at it. He'll kill it. Somehow. God, this was the most bullshit episode. They tried pulling another Jack death right at the end, which definitely wasn't fooling me. It's slow, it's shite, and all just so it can connect to the Utopia episode. What a joke. And that just about wraps up my thoughts on series one, guys. God, that took me longer than I thought. Hope you enjoyed this. Comment below your thoughts, and I'll see you all when I've wrapped up my review of series two.